Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geocentac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTUP and ESDCP. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's event. This webinar focuses on DOD-funded research efforts to identify reliable techniques for detailed survey of unexploded ordnance, or UXO, at underwater remediation sites. Following brief introductory remarks, Dr. Stephen Billings from Black Tusk Geophysics will discuss the development of a marine advanced geophysical classification system that combines an electromagnetic induction center, sensor and a non-metallic stowfish to detect and classify medium-sized ordnance in water depths between five and 150 feet. This talk will be followed by a Q&A session. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you've not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you're unable to download Zoom or you have technical difficulties, you can view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you are unable to view the slides or if your screen freezes, Try keying in control and F5 to force a hard refresh of your browser. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the join audio button, select test speaker and microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, feel free to call into the conference line shown here. You can also submit a comment using the chat box in Zoom. Please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for Steve. And in case of continued difficulties, you can download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Keep in mind that we will be live streaming the webinar on the CERTUP and ESCCP YouTube channel. So that's another um, option for viewing today's uh, proceedings. The broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session to submit your questions. We do encourage you to submit them well advanced of the Q&A session. And when you put your questions in, we ask that you please add your organization name at the end so that we can identify it during the Q&A session. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. David Bradley, who is the CERTUP and ESCCP Program Manager for the Munitions Response Program area. Dr. Bradley's professional career includes U.S. Navy supported research, laboratory directorship at the NATO Undersea Research Center in Italy, and research academic activities at Pennsylvania State University's Applied Research Lab. An emeritus professor of acoustics, um, he is currently an APL, a University of Washington staff member assigned to the CERTUP and ESCCP program office. And he is a fellow of the Acoustical Society and has chaired society committees and served um, as a president. Uh, Dave, please proceed. Okay, thanks, Rula. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm looking. I am looking forward, and I am uh, assuring you that you will be seeing a, both an exciting and interesting presentation by Steve. Uh, next slide, Laura. Uh, the next few slides will give you kind of a quick overview of SERDP or CERDP, as we often say, and ESTCP. Uh, CERTUP is the word, it's an acronym for Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. Uh, the focus of it is fundamental research through advanced uh, technology development. 
ESCCP, on the other hand, the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program is typically the continuation of efforts that have begun in CERTIP, although they don't necessarily have to have their origin there. Uh, but it, it is the field demonstration and the, from the viewpoint of the office, the transition uh, point of a, of a particular development effort. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's several environmental drivers. You see some examples uh, that you see here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, they, they take uh, obviously many different forms, but from the viewpoint of uh, munition uh, uh, remediation it is things like maritime sustainability, threatened and endangered species, climate impacts, and obviously uh, unexploded ordnance and the constituents uh, within those ordnance uh, uh, rounds. Next. A, a key driver from the viewpoint of the Department of Defense is the reduction of current and future liabilities. Uh, contaminants, uh, the, the uh, activities performed in past years uh, sometimes, uh, and there's many, many examples, of course, as I know the audience is well aware of uh, practices that uh, basically come back to haunt us. And, and uh, those are things that we're both trying to mitigate against and plan for in, in future developments. Next slide. There's uh, multiple areas of focus and, and they're listed here. I won't read them for you, uh, but there, uh, there should be no surprises uh, in, in that list. Uh, next slide. Uh, from the viewpoint of the office, uh, technology transfer is, is an extremely important aspect of it. Uh, and it includes a, a number of things. Uh, these webinars are a perfect example of, of something that uh, is a very key piece uh, to, to the, uh, the general uh, area of technology transfer. But again, the slide gives you uh, some uh, visual view of, of uh, how we look at it. Okay, next, and, and I believe the last slide, or next to the last slide, uh, we have a series. Uh, the next one from the MR viewpoint is in January of next year, but the list shows you uh, up through January of next year, the, the upcoming list. Uh, I encourage you to uh, look at them and, and, uh, and uh, participate to the extent that, uh, that you can, that your time allows and, and your interest is there. Uh, next slide is there's additional information on this website that probably the most important thing is that uh, all of these webinars are archived and they are accessible to you. And we certainly encourage your, your reaching back uh, if your interest is there. And uh, finally, the last slide, uh, registration is now open. We, we have an annual symposium. The dates are there November 20, this year, November 29th to December 2nd in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, actually, it's if you know the uh, Washington area at all, it's sort of at the back door of the Ronald Reagan uh, Airport. Uh, and, and again, uh, I'll, I'll repeat what I said just a moment ago, which is uh, uh, this the presentation today is available and can be downloaded. Uh, there's also a survey that uh, will pop up uh, at the end of your uh, the, the uh, presentation today. Uh, I, I'm not gonna just hope that you enjoy the presentation. I know you will. Uh, over to you, Steve. Thank you so much, Dave. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Stephen Billings. Uh, Steve has joint appointments with Black Dusk Geophysics in Canada and Gas Explosive Ordnance Detection in Australia. 
Steve is also an adjunct professor in Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of British Columbia. He has over 25 years of experience working with geophysical sensor data, including 20 years focused on improving methods for UXO detection and characterization. He has served CI on startup and ESCCP munitions response projects, and he earned a bachelor's degree in theoretical mathematical physics from the Australian National University and a doctoral degree in geophysics from the University of Sydney. Steve, we're very happy to have you. Please go ahead. Well, hello everyone. Um, the focus of the webinar today is gonna be on the development and demonstration of what we call the Ultra Team of Four system. That's an underwater metal detector with advanced geophysical classification capabilities. Now the Ultra Team of Four is a collaboration between Black Tusk Geophysics of Canada. Um, Black Tusk contribute the data acquisition and processing software uh, of gap explosive ordnance detection from Australia. They contribute the Ultra Tem hardware and you can see that on this picture here of the um, the towfish, uh, basically the yellow uh, squares are transmitters and the black shapes you can see in there are receivers. So there's four transmitters and 12 receivers in this system. Um, and the Ultra Tem system is housed on uh, our third collaborator, TetraTech of the United States. It's housed on the Tema towfish platform. And um, I would like to acknowledge uh, Richard Funk, Jeff Gamey, and the rest of the team at TetraTech for their assistance and their involvement in the development of this system. Presentation outline. Um, I'd like to start with giving you a bit of a description of a project from 2015, uh, which really provides some motivation for what we call AGC. And actually, before I go on, I think most people here are probably clear with what we mean by the acronym AGC, Advanced Geophysical Classification. But for those that aren't specialists, um, let, let me just define that term. So the Ultra Tem is a metal detector. So it's very good at detecting the metallic targets of interest, such as sea mines, artillery projectiles, bombs, et cetera, that you'd find in a marine environment but it also detects a lot of non-hazardous items. Uh, that could be things like crab pots, anchors, steel wire, rope. So AGC is a, an objective, repeatable, defensible process for deciding whether you need to dig an item as a potentially hazardous item or whether you can safely leave it in the ground. So that's what we mean when we talk about AGC. Uh, so after I describe the uh, Portsmouth Harbour project, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to make the AGC process successful. Uh, quick review of terrestrial AGC and then talk a little bit about marine specific challenges. And then most of the rest of the focus of the talk is going to be on uh, the development of the Ultra Team of Four system uh, and in particular uh, demonstration of that system last year at uh, Swim Bay, uh, where we did an extended shakedown test. Um, we also took the system to, to Swim Bay in September this year, uh, and we're still processing the data from that. So this webinar is not going to discuss that. Uh, I'm hoping to present results on the September this year demonstration at the symposium later this year. So let's start with um, this example uh, application at Portsmouth Harbour. So back in 2015, uh, the Royal Navy was in the process of commissioning the Queen Elizabeth class of aircraft carriers. Now that's the biggest warship built outside of the United States since the Second World War. It's almost but not quite as large as the Gerald Ford and Nimitz class aircraft carriers. Now, Portsmouth Harbour has been used by the Royal Navy for something like 800 years. 
Um, the harbour itself was extensively bombed during the Second World War. Uh, the harbour approaches were mined. Um, so to get this aircraft carrier into Portsmouth Harbour, they needed to dredge a channel down to 16 metres below lowest astronomical tide. That's the blue colours that you can see in the bathymetry image that I'm showing. And then some of the areas were only at about two metres. Uh, that's the yellow that you can see here. So they had to dredge up to 14 metres of material to get this aircraft carrier into Portsmouth Harbour. Now, the initial technique they were using to support the dredging surveys was uh, a magnetometer survey. And actually, one thing I forgot to mention before was, so the targets of interest in the outer harbour were items 250 pound or larger or large dredging hazards. Now, what I'm showing you here is a perspective view of a magnetometer survey. So where you see the change in the colours and particularly things that go from blue to pink, uh, that's metallic items uh, on the sea bottom or buried underneath it. You, you can see there are some extremely cluttered areas, principally along the channel itself. Now, there were two big problems for magnetometry. The first one was just after the um, initial dredging started, a German LMB mine was encountered. Now, this is a large item. It's 2.19 metres long, uh, about 86 inches, uh, and it's designed to shink, sink ships. Uh, the big problem for magnetometry is it's aluminium, so it's undetectable. The second big problem for magnetometry is that there's a very large number of targets. Um, just in that first outer layer, there were 2,480. Now, magnetometry has limited classification capabilities. And our client, which was Boscalis Westminster of um, the UK and the Netherlands, uh, with the system they were using for reacquiring and disposing of anomalies, they could do about 20 targets per 24 hour shift. So you can see it was going to take somewhere on the order of 124 continuous days just to clear the first layer. Now, when the magnetometer survey was collected, that was around December 2015, the Queen Elizabeth was meant to arrive around September. So immediately there was a bit of a time problem. So we got involved in this project with the development of um, a system that in Europe they call the SUBTEM. So that's an underwater metal detector. Um, the red shapes that you can see are transmitters. There are five transmitters. Uh, the circular black shapes you can see, they're receivers. There are 26, actually I think there's 28 receivers. Uh, and that system is about 5.4 metres wide. Um, I'm trying to make sure I remember to convert everything into Imperial as well. So that's about 18 feet. Um, later on, this is going to be important. But so one of the things I'd, I'd just like to point out now is um, for, for AGC, you tend to need a, uh, multiple transmitters and multiple receivers. So that's that's one thing that I just want you to remember. So it's got multiple transmitters, multiple receivers. And it was deployed on a, uh, I think the thing I forgot to mention before was it was deployed on a sled. So it was basically just pulled over the sea bottom. So the system was nice and close to the targets of interest. Now, what I'm showing you here is a little section of total field data. And I think those squares are each about 25 meters. Uh, and the triangles are the targets were identified from the magnetometer survey. Next slide is showing you the same area with those same magnetic targets uh, as triangles. And what I'm showing you here is, is it's, it's called the, a long track component. And that has a sign change when you go over an object. And you can see um, a few things stand out here. The sub -tem data is much higher resolution. So you are seeing a lot more targets. So obviously our client's not gonna be very happy if we change the technology, detect a lot more things and tell them they've got to dig a lot more items. 
And that's where AGC comes in. So what we did is for every target detection, we basically extract a little region around that area. And then we fit what's called a polarization tensor model um, to the data. What I'm showing you here is an example over an item that was quite small, um, smaller than an 81 millimeter mortar. Uh, that's not something that the client was particularly concerned about. Uh, the images on the left, they show you the X component, which is cross track, Y component, a long track, Z component is vertical. Uh, the very left is the observed data. The middle is a predicted and the one on the right is the residual. So again, this is AGC. We're trying to follow an objective, repeatable, uh, quantitative process to make our dig, no dig decisions. Here I'm showing you an example of an item that would definitely make it onto the dig list. Uh, and that was a 500 pound bomb that was encountered in the outer channel. Um, and you can see uh, the, the colored curves in the top right, that's the polarizability. Think of that as a fingerprint. It's significantly larger than the largest item we had in our library at that point, which was a six inch naval projectile. Um, most important thing here is this is an item that goes on to our dig list. So now it's a little bit hard to see here, um, particularly the reds, which are the things that you should dig. Um, so what we've done is we've turned all the things we don't think are hazardous. Um, so they're not UX, they're not large UXO, they're not dredging hazards, they're green. So we're saying, don't worry about those, you can dredge those without specifically going and grabbing each particular item. Uh, and you can see that most of the items are turned green and there are not a lot that are red, although it is, I'm finding it is very hard to see the red items and I'm just trying to circle a few here with my mouse. Now, if we go back to the magnetometer image, uh, you can see that there are certain red items that correspond with the black triangles. So they were the digs from the magnetics, like this one here, where I'm, I'm showing you with my mouse. But there are other ones like this item here. So the magnetometry thought it was a large single item. And with the subtem, much higher resolution, we could tell it was a lot of small items. And just to summarize the performance um, across four different layers. So what would happen is we would do a survey, we would identify the UXOs. Uh, they would pull that up, not all, sorry, not all UXOs. We would identify the things that were large and had to be taken care of specifically before dredging. Um, they would then dredge two meters. We would do another survey, repeat the process, and here I'm showing you, um, there was four different layers in the, the outer harbor and our classification efficiency was somewhere around 97%. So only 3% of the targets that were detected required follow-up. So this is particularly important in a marine setting because it is very expensive to recover items um, when they're underwater. The example we were showing here at Portsmouth, they were using a barge and a grab. Uh, sometimes it might be divers. And if you need to use divers to recover items, uh, that's a large dig team and it, it's very expensive per, per anomaly. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to make AGC successful. And I'm going to go back a little bit because there, there's a varied mix of people on this call. Um, so I know a lot of people understand how a time domain EM system works, but I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview. Um, basically, with a TEM measurement, there are three different stages. There's what we call the on time, which is stage one, and that's where we turn the transmitter on. And you can see the red lines here. So that's a primary magnetic field created by the transmitter turning on. Stage two uh, is what we call the early off time. That's where we abruptly turn off the transmitter. And what that does is it induces eddy currents in any metallic items 
that are in proximity to your system. Uh, and those eddy currents evolve and decay over time. But most importantly, they produce a secondary magnetic field, these blue lines here, and that's what we sense. Now, this on and off time happens many times a second. So it depends on what specific mode you're operating at. For the data that I'm gonna show you today, um, the on and off is happening 180 times per second. Sometimes we can slow it down and do 25, uh, 50 times per second, which allows us to record the decay for longer in time. But we find with dynamic systems, that rate of about 180 times per second is about right. Now, what I'm showing you here is just an example of one of the decays you would measure. So the system at left is a, a, a cable tracking system. Uh, it's got a single transmitter, which is that yellow uh, loop. That's 1.8 by 1.8 meters or six feet by six feet. And there are actually six receivers, uh, which are all three component along the center line. And I'm just showing you two of the vertical component responses for when the metal item was present. So that's the black and red. And then when the metal item is not present, that's the cyan and blue. Um, so the important thing is that um, when you've got seawater, it's conductive. So the process of turning the transmitter on and turning it off produces a strong response from the, from the seawater. Um, it's particularly strong at very early times. You can see there's not much difference at early time between when the metal item is present and when the seawater uh, is there without the metal item present. But as you go later in time, you can see the seawater response dies out very quickly and the metal response persists. And that's something that allows us to transition a lot of the techniques and hardware that was developed for terrestrial into the marine environment, as long as we avoid those, those very early times. Stepping back a bit, um, just thinking about why terrestrial sensors are successful at AGC. Um, and, and if you look at sensors that are deployed for terrestrial AGC, they tend to have multiple transmitters, uh, like this example here with the original metal mapper system. It had three transmitters that were um, basically orthogonal to each other. Um, most systems have multiple three axis receivers and they take high resolution measurements of the time decay. So we don't just get one or two measurements of that time evolution of the eddy currents, we get multiple measurements. And actually when I was looking at this slide, I realized the MPV here only has a single transmitter, but you can stick um, an extra two transmitters on top of that to make it into a multi-transmitter system. Now, in this uh, blue direction here, and you get an equal, uh, equally small response as the green one. So you can tell this is a large item. Well, actually, no, you can tell this is an item that has axial symmetry. And then it's got a high degree of likelihood of being a UXO. Of course, it's very rare that you deploy your system and you get exactly what are called the principal axes. So what happens usually is you take a lot of measurements and then you have to extract the principal axes from, from those multiple measurements. And that is done in a, uh, effectively uh, an inversion process. Now, I've just got this simple equation here which describes terrestrial sensing. And I just wanna go through it and, and 
tell you a little bit about why things work quite well in terrestrial sensing for AGC. So D here is, is the data and it depends on where you are, uh, the position of your object, uh, the time of your measurement. Uh, so then there's a signal, a background and a noise measurement. Terrestrial AGC works so well because we have a very accurate physical model. Unless you get really close to the item, uh, the response is dipolar and it's quite straightforward to model. Um, there are good methods for dealing with multiple objects in the field of view. Uh, because of the quality of RTK GPS systems, we can typically position to within centimeters. So our sensor positions are highly accurate. So that helps a lot if you're trying to do your AGC from uh, a dynamic platform, so you're continuously moving. Uh, there's also possibilities of taking a cued measurement where you just stop, and then there's no positional ambiguity as you cycle through your different transmitters. Uh, the third thing is typically you can get good background estimates. Um, that, that's actually not always the case. If you, if you deal in sites with a bit of infrastructure or magnetic soils, uh, the background can produce a challenge, but I would say, you know, most of the time you can, you can remove the background. The fourth thing is you're typically very close to the items of interest. So you can generally get fairly high signal to noise. And if you need to, you can do cued measurements to increase your signal to noise. Now let's think about the same four considerations with marine sensing. Um, the first thing is, and particularly early on when people were trying to use TEM methods for um, marine sensing, there was a bit of a question about whether the dipole model, the same dipole model you use in terrestrial sensing would work, or whether there are interaction effects between the object and the conductive seawater. There actually are interaction effects, but when, when you look into it, they tend to only affect the very early times and when you're at a significant distance away from your object. So just by choosing the right time channels, you can avoid the interaction effects, and you can basically use a lot of the machinery you've already developed for the terrestrial environment in the marine environment. A big challenge with marine sensing is just being able to position the sensor itself. Uh, underwater positioning is much less accurate and much more challenging than a terrestrial system. Um, so you even with state-of-the-art technologies, you tend not to be able to position your sensors as accurately as you do in the terrestrial realm. The third thing is, and I mentioned this before in those example measurements, is that um, there can be a strong background response from the seawater itself, and that response can change with water depth and temp temperature, sensor height, sediment composition. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, the fourth challenge, and probably one of the biggest, is that often you cannot get close to the sea bottom. So that means that you may not be able to get as high a signal to noise ratio as you can from the equivalent terrestrial pace. So really the only way to counteract that is to try and put more power into your transmitter and make your transmitters big. That's why when you see all the systems we've developed for marine sensing, um, they've all got big transmitters, uh, roughly in that sort of six foot by six foot range. So next I'd like to talk a little bit more about the Ultra Team of Four system, and then I'll go over the uh, results from the Swim Bay uh, extended shakedown from October last year. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, there's four collaborators and, and sorry, four, I mean three collaborators and three different system components that make up the ultra team of four. 
And actually, maybe I should just mention, why do we call it the Ultra Team of Four? Uh, that's because the Team of Toefish platform was on its fourth generation. And just by coincidence, the Ultra Team hardware was also on its fourth generation. So we decided to brand the system as the Ultra Team of Four. Um, so the team of tow platform, it's tested and proven uh, marine tow to ray system. Uh, the important thing for marine AGC is it's capable of control, controlled low level flight above the sea bottom. Um, and another really critical and important thing about the teamer is not just the tow platform, it's the positioning system that's on the ugly duckling vessel. I'm just going to jump over to the, the slide that has, um, has the image of the tow platform on it. But the ugly duckling has a very sophisticated positioning system, uh, which is made by IX Blue. Uh, it combines a, a GAPS USBL, that's ultra short baseline acoustic system, with um, a FINS inertial navigation system. And it also has an RTK GPS system on it. Um, that positioning system is, is about a half a million dollar investment. Um, and you're going to see that we get some excellent positions. Um, but I guess it's really just to emphasize if you want to do accurate positioning underwater, you've got to be serious. You've got to spend some big dollars to get some, some accurate technology. Now, just flicking back to the previous slide. Um, so the other part of the system is the UltraTem hardware developed by GAP EOD. Um, the important thing maybe to, to point out is that hardware is DAGCAP validated. And you saw that Portsmouth example, that was actually the UltraTem 2 marine system uh, that was deployed at Portsmouth. So it's been well tested in marine environments. Um, the third part of the system is the um, software for both data acquisition and processing. Uh, and that's contributed by BT Field of Black Tusk and um, BT Field software has also been DAGCAP validated, but in the terrestrial realm, not for marine AGC. This is basically the same slide, but just showing you different, the, the actual physical components. Um, the UltraTem hardware image there is of a two transmitter, six receiver terrestrial towed array. And their image at the bottom is um, of the BT field data acquisition interface. So when we first pitched this concept to ESTCP, uh, we thought we were gonna be developing a system that looks something like this. It's actually very similar to the sub 10 system that was deployed on Portsmouth Harbour. It's got a pyramid arrangement of transmitters, but instead of five of them, there are just three. And instead of 28 receivers, there are 13. Um, so we thought that layout would be effective, but it actually takes up a lot of space. And it had a, a significant disadvantage of putting the electronic boxes at the back of the team of towfish. So after Portsmouth Harbour, we, um, we developed a terrestrial system. Uh, we call this the UltraTem classifier. Uh, and we took this system to APG and got it DAGCAP validated for one pass uh, AGC. And one of the key things with this system, different to what we did in Portsmouth, is instead of having the pyramid of arrangement of transmitters We've got an overlapping sequence of transmitters. There are actually four of them, the ones in blue. And then there's a single vertical transmitter, the green one, uh, that gives you a long track excitation. So really the idea with any sort of dynamic AGC system is you wanna hit every point in space with ideally three orthogonal transmitter excitations. So vertical, cross track, and a long track. So this sort of arrangement is very effective for doing that. But the problem is you don't really want a vertical transmitter on a marine system. It would be very difficult to deploy, create a lot of hydrodynamic drag. 
so this is the layout that we ended up with. Um, so there are 12 receivers. So they're the black shapes that you can see. We call them receiver T tubes. So um, they're all three component sensors. So we get our vertical cross track and a long track secondary mag uh, magnetic fields, time rate of change of that. That's what they measure. And then the system has four, four transmitters. So there were three of our 1.8 by 1.8 meter wides, six foot by six foot. Uh, they're stacked, well, they're end to end, two, two outer ones, and then one over the top in the middle. And then it's kind of hard to see, but in front of all of them is a transmitter that's twice as long and half as deep, and it's offset to the front. So that's the one that's given you the along track excitation. And then I'm not sort of going to talk too much about this, but we also upgraded the electronics in the Ultratem. So the Portsmouth examples all had rectangular boxes. Uh, we've now put all the electronics into circular enclosures, and you can see those at the front of the, the team of towfish. So as mentioned, we went to Squim Bay in September 2021, and here are our performance objectives. So we wanted to make sure we could stay close to the sea bottom. So we had an objective on the altitude. Uh, we didn't want to deviate by more than uh, one foot from our target altitude. We also wanted the platform to be very stable. So there was a metric on the, the attitude. Uh, we also wanted to be able to closely follow lines. Um, it becomes very difficult and expensive if you have a system where you can't cover 100% of the area. Um, so accurate line following is important. Um, we wanted locations to be better than 50 centimetres uh, because if you're going to send divers down, you don't want them groping around trying to find the target of interest. You want them to, as much as you can in the marine environment, environment navigate straight down and um, right onto the anomaly that you want them to recover. Um, there was a metric on the EMI noise. At a minimum, we wanted to be able to detect an 81 millimeter mortar to 1.5 meter standoff. Um, there was a metric on how usable the data is for classification. And then there was a small section of a blind grid that was surveyed. So we wanted to detect all the targets of interest and reject most of the, the false alarms. Now, there were, was a calibration line, actually two calibration lanes established at uh, Swim Bay. One, one of them had a bunch of medium and large ISO items, um, six of each. And then there were a bunch of multiple surrogate UXO and clutter items put in a separate lane and a circular blind grid area that was around 1.95 acres. And that had items as small as a 60 millimeter mortar. Um, water depths were between 20 and 25 meters. That information is, is summarized here. So you can see there's a lane to the north, which has all the medium and large ISO items. And we arrange them um, two of each cross track, two of each along track, two of each vertical. And then here's a below that, you can see the list of different items that were put in the, we, we, we called it the must calibration lane because that's um, Kevin Williams deployed his acoustic system at this site at the same time. That was the calibration lane configuration he wanted. Um, the lane to the north, we call the ultra term calibration lane because that's the calibration lane layout we wanted. Here's a few images of the system being deployed. Um, one, of, one of the things that always strikes me when you, you do any marine surveying is the number of computer screens and stations that you have on a vessel. So the captain himself will have a screen. He's trying to follow your, your survey lines. Um, the person running the positioning system, high pack software, they'll have all of their screens. Uh, the person running the ultra tem 
system will have their screens and that's the station we're seeing here. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the little shape in blue that's being pointed to, that's the calibration lane that's produced in real time. Um, there's additional screens for the, for the person who's controlling the height of the sensor above the, the water bottom. So the way that's controlled is it's just how much cable you pull in and pull out. Um, and it's also impacted by your boat speed. Now, as I mentioned, one of the important things about making marine AGC success successful is to try and get as close to the target of interest as you want. What I'm showing you here is a, um, a distribution and then a cumulative distribution relative to one meter of one of our test surveys at, um, actually, I think this one was at Ostrich Bay. But the point being that um, I think somewhere like 90% of the time we're within 25 centimeters of the target elevation. So what that means is the team of towfish is capable of controlled low level flight. So that's one of the important characteristics for or requirements for a marine AGC. Now I just wanted to say a few things about um, the seawater background, which I've mentioned um, previously. Uh, my colleague Lin Ping Song uh, at Black Tusk has developed an integral equation technique to basically model the response of different layers. Uh, the integral equation technique basically takes care of propagations and reflections of fields at interfaces. Um, during the swim bay demonstration, there was a conductivity depth temperature profiles taken. Uh, conductivity was quite steady through the 23 meter uh, water depth profile here at around 3.6 Siemens per meter. Um, you can see the temperature didn't change very much, 10.6 degrees Celsius, which I think is 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and salinity, which is related to conductivity, also fairly constant. So my colleague Lin Ping Song modeled the seawater response as a three layer. Um, obviously air is zero Siemens per meter, it's not conductive. A 23 meter thick layer at 3.6 Siemens per meter. And then we made an assumption that the sediment was at one Siemens per meter. Now, what I'm showing you here is in red um, down the bottom, I've highlighted receiver two and receiver five. Uh, so this is a profile of receiver two here on the top left. This next one down is receiver five. This shows our altitude above the sea bottom and our water depth. Um, what I'd like to point out is as you're up near closer to the water surface, you're getting a stronger response. That's reflections off the, the, the air water interface. And then the background response changes as you uh, reduces as you come down to survey altitude. And then what I've highlighted here is these two features, T1 and T2. These are the time decays for receiver two and receiver five at those two different locations. And then the blue is the predicted and the red, sorry, the blue is the actual and the red is the predicted response from Lin Ping's model. So I think the important take home message here is that we can actually model the seawater background response with this integral equation technique. So you can model the seawater response and then remove it from the data. I'm now gonna go through and describe some of the calibration lane um, data and fits that we got. So this is a heat map. Um, so the reds are stronger signals and the yellows are weak signals. And if you look through this image carefully, uh, actually, I think it's, it's a bit hard for, for you in the audience to see that um, we actually get signals over the 40 and 60 millimeter items in the, the mass calibration lane. Uh, we get strong signals over the large and medium ISO items. And I'm actually gonna spend a bit of time going over that data. Oh. Actually, let me step back. 
the first thing I'm going to do is go over the position comparison of, so every time we detect an anomaly, we fit a polarization tensor model to, a, we derive a position. We compare that position to um, PNNL's ground truth. Uh, and then this shows the difference between the ultra Tima derived position and the PNNL ground truth. And you can see most items are within 50 centimeters. Almost all of them are within one meter. But then it becomes a question of whose ground truth or whose positions are more accurate, the PNNL ground truth, because it is challenging just to position in the underwater environment, or the ultra tem derived positions. So what I'm showing you here is a comparison of our positions when we encountered the same item multiple times, because we measured that calibration grid, basically calibration line, basically every day. So if you look, you can see that um, this item I005 here in purple, most of the positions lie in the same area. The greens, which is I002, they also cluster together. So we actually calculated an RMS error of the um, ultra teamer of about 20 centimeters. So remarkably accurate, I think, for the marine environment. Now, this is a close-up of the medium and large ISO items. Um, so there are six large ISO items and six medium ISO. Um, on right, I'm showing you one of the inversion fits that just sort of shows you that we can actually model the data quite well. And this shows you for those 12 items, um, this would be the dig list order. So it's a little hard to see because the colored, there's red and purple and black lines. If they lie right on top of the green line, the green line is the reference for the, for the large ISO for the first six items. And then the green line is the reference for the medium ISO for the second six. So you can see for the large ISO items, you're getting almost perfect recovery of the polarizability. For the medium ISO items, it's not too bad, but it's, it's not perfect. So we wanted to figure out, could we improve the quality of those medium ISO items? Uh, the polarizability is recovered from medium ISO items. So e even though the positions derived by the team are quite accurate, they're not necessarily accurate enough to just throw into a inversion algorithm and pull out accurate polarizabilities. So we developed something we call independent model location inversion. So what you do with that method is you allow the position and the orientation of your target item to vary slightly between different lines. So if you've got two lines going over a, an item and there's a little bit of positional ambiguity, the IMLI method takes that into account and allows a little bit of uh, tweaking of the position and orientation to occur to get a better model match. Here's some examples of the IMLI data fits. So there are multiple lines going over these particular items. And you can see in each case, the observed data, which is on the left, pretty much matches the predicted data that's, that's in the middle. Uh, and again, just to remind everyone, um, the rows are cross track, a long track, and then vertical. So there's always three components. So let's have a look at how the IMLI method works on one of those diff more difficult medium ISO items. So with a standard method where you just throw all the data into your equivalent terrestrial algorithm, you get the wrong size. So you may decide that this is not big enough to be uh, a medium ISO item. One thing you can do is just throw out uh, adjacent lines and just process each line at a time. So you do better, but you, you are actually throwing away information when you do that because with marine AGC, you're often gonna be signal to noise limited. So you wanna use as much information as you can. 
bottom left, you can see um, the IMLI method does a great job of recovering the polarizabilities of that medium ISO item. You can also enforce a different constraint to make the decay be monotonic. So it's always got to decrease. I'm next going to go through the IMLI performance on um, some of the large ISO items when we purposely flew the system much higher above the calibration lane. So this is 1.75 meter standoff. Um, and you can see that we do quite a nice job of recovering the polarizabilities. Uh, and here's one of the examples shown, or one of those large ISO items shown with the standard method in the top left, throwing out one line in the top right, standard IMLI bottom left, and then monotonic decay in the bottom right. You can see we're definitely improving things. Now, one of the things that kind of surprised us is um, we actually managed to detect and get reasonable polarizabilities over a 40 millimeter projectile and a 60 millimeter mortar in the, the MUS calibration lane. Um, I mean, normally we, we say that we're targeting items of 81 millimeter and larger in caliber, but obviously if you can get down close to the targets of interest, you can extend your detection and classification round range down to those smaller items. Now I've probably got another five minutes or so to go. So I'm, I'm just gonna talk through um, the blind grid performance at, at Swim Bay. So last year was really a shakedown test. So the blind grid was set up to test Kevin Williams's must system. But on our last day, we had some time and we managed to cover, I think it's somewhere around 65% of the blind grid. Uh, and you can see our detections. We then followed through with the AGC process. Um, and the dig targets are in red and the no dig targets are, are in green. We submitted that ranked dig list to Ida who then scored it. So we classified 27 objects as things that needed to be dug and 10 items were classified as being most likely to be clutter. Um, it's actually a curious ratio here, like in terrestrial sites, you, you often expect, you know, your clutter levels to be many, many times bigger than the numbers of targets of interest, but it's, it's kind of difficult and expensive to establish test grids in the marine environment. So there tends to be a higher number of test objects than there are clutter items. Now this shows the, um, the actual ground truth for the 2021 line test. So there were 18 clutter items um, and 17 UXOs within the section of data where the ultra teamer was deployed. So the things out to the fringes, for instance, like this C033, uh, this other one here on the left side, U014, we didn't encounter that with the ultra tem data. So we're just scored on this central section here. Now, the TOIs are as red stars here. Uh, and then the dig, no dig and clutter are as different colors. It's a little bit hard to um, interpret this image. So it's probably easier if I just go straight to the ROC curve. Um, so I presume most of you are familiar with an ROC curve, but um, if you think of an analogy of, um, if this is the continental United States and you're starting in San Diego, you wanna go straight north to the Canadian border um, and that's perfect performance. So it's number of UXOs correctly or targets of interest correctly classified, number of false digs along the horizontal axis. So you can see um, we got 100% of the UXOs after digging five false positives, and then our stop dig point was at 10 false positives. 
So we were actually pretty pleased with that performance. And that does include two 60 millimeter projectiles that were in the blind grid. There were no 40 millimeters or, or anything smaller than a, a 60 millimeter. So overall, we think the um, swim bay demonstration was successful. Uh, and then, as I've mentioned at the, during the introduction, we've also gone back to swim bay in September and we've got a full blind grid. Uh, we've got the, the blind grid at lowest possible elevation, a higher elevation, and then in two different transmitter modes. So we've actually got three different data sets. Um, hopefully we'll have most of those scored by the symposium, although that may be a little bit too soon, but um, I'm sure I'll be presenting on that at a future forum. So now I'm just moving on to the conclusions and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Um, I think with the swim bay shakedown test, we've demonstrated that marine AGC is feasible. Uh, importantly, the, the team of four platform can stay close to the sea bottom. It's stable. Uh, it's ac it can accurately position items. The fact that it's a passive control of the towfish platform means that it's very low electromagnetic noise. Um, so it's quite a low noise environment. Um, the ultra tem sensor has large transmitter coils with high current that allows you to maintain good standoff. Uh, and actually we are working on a project with Dan Steinhurst and the Naval Research Lab to effectively triple the transmitter field or the, the size of the current in the transmitter. So we can try and achieve good results even further away from the sea bottom. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, you know there can be some interaction effects uh, between the seawater and objects of interest, but if you just avoid those early times, you can reuse a lot of the machinery you've developed for terrestrial AGC in the marine environment. And we, we think there are strong positive benefits to DOD, uh, it's a bit of an unknown of exactly how many contaminated sites there are, um, but we feel a, an EMI sensor with strong dynamic classification ability, uh, you know, can significantly reduce remediation costs by removing the need for divers. Uh, and of course, it really needs to be single pass operation to eliminate the need for multiple surveys. And I think with that, that's the end of my webinar and we open the floor to questions. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Just as a reminder to our audience members, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We've received a lot of questions for you, so I'm gonna start relaying them. The first one, Steve, is from the US Army Garrison in Hawaii. Uh, what's the maximum detection underwater depth for the Ultra Tima system that does not compromise the accuracy of the detection? I, I guess I'm wondering, is that question around the water depth that we can deploy the system? That's how I'm going to answer that question. So, um, the enclosures are all rated to 100 meters. So at least we can get the system down to 100 meters. Uh, there is of course gonna be a range dependent degradation in the positions. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure I know exactly the, what percentage that is, but that's something I can always follow up later on and get a number. Sounds good, thank you. The next question is from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, what is the depth that the sensor can scan into sediments? Yes, so it really doesn't matter what the material is, it's just how close to the targets of interest you are. 
So if you're in air or if it's solid rock, uh, it effectively makes no difference. And the thing that dic dictates performance is, as I say, just how far away you are. Um, so our goal was a 81 millimeter mortar to at least 1.5 meter standoff. So that's, you know, if you can get to within half a meter above the sea bottom, that means you could get your 81 millimeter mortar to one meter. If you can only get, if you can only get as close as one meter, then you're only going to see that 81 millimeter mortar to half a meter into the sediment. And Steve, a follow-on question from the same individual at New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, you did not talk about this, but uh, have you done any work uh, to try and elaborate on the maximum depth the equipment could remove materials from the sediment without diver support? Uh, yeah, that's that. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question. That's more on the remediation side. So if you've got a target detection that is, you know, a meter into the sediment, how are you going to recover that item? Um, that, that becomes quite difficult. And in some of those European uh, operations that I've mentioned, um, you know, often there'll be items two or two and a half meters under the sea bottom, and it takes them an awful long time. Usually they've got to dredge a quite a wide hole around the item. Um, so if they're going down two and a half meters, they might have to go out five, six meter radius or diameter hole in order to recover that item. So it, it is very challenging to, to recover items at depth. Well, thank you for entertaining this question. The next one is from the US Army Corps of Engineers, the Northwestern Division, Omaha District. What are the prospects for applying the this, this system to small ISO items or objects? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, as I think if, if we can get close to the sea bottom or the lake bottom, then I think we can do quite well with um, small ISO items. As I said, I was quite pleasantly surprised by how well we recovered the polarizabilities on a 40 millimeter projectile, which is similar in size to a small ISO. So again, it's all about proximity. As long as we can get close enough, we could do quite well. Wonderful. This next question is also from the US Army Corps of Engineers. Could you give us some idea of the cost, uh, of what cost will be involved for the surveys that are generated um, by, the, by, by the tool that you described and also the, the cost for interpreting the data? Cool. That's, yeah, I mean, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, I think we're, we're early stage with, um, you know, proposing this technology on commercial projects. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, the costs are quite a bit more than terrestrial, because um, to build an underwater sensor is, you know, we, we could probably say it's twice as expensive, at least. Um, so let's say your, your cost would be double just for the sensor component. And then instead of being able to push the system around, uh, you need to deploy an entire vessel with, a, I mentioned before, the, you know, the positioning system alone is half a million dollars. Um, so you've got that part on top of that. Um, so in terms of the hardware, I think the costs are going to be significantly more than terrestrial. The data processing, I think it's going to be quite similar. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything necessarily particularly difficult about processing marine data compared to terrestrial. So I, I'd say they'd be about one for one. So that was a bit of an arm wavy answer. I mean, I, I can't really predict an actual number per day for the system. 
this next question is from the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, during data processing, how much height variation on data for a single target can the system handle? And are there checks in the software to assess point-by-point -point data quality? Yes, um, good question. So we model the full three-dimensional path of, of, of the sensor. So if there's a bit of variation, um, as long as we're accurately tracking that, then we can include that in our modeling. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second question? The second part, are there checks in the software to assess point by point data? Yes, so we would look at the residuals and look and see if there's any structure in there. We've also got a number of metrics that we, we calculate. Um, so if we're not fitting the data particularly well, those metrics are going to flag those anomalies as ones we should take a second look at. And actually, let me just go back to that height question as well. One thing about the Towfish platform is it, it, it can't change its height very well. So it's actually compared to terrestrial, in some ways their marine environment is better because a terrestrial sensor can bounce up and down. So you can get a lot of uh, vibration noise and a lot of short wavelengths variations in, in the, the height. A system like the Tima, it cannot change height very quickly. Uh, so we would tend to see just very slow, steady changes of height, which I think helps with um, making sure that's not a significant detriment to the quality of the interpretation. Great, thank you so much. Um, this next question is from the Hawaii Department of Health. So bear with me because it's a slightly long question. Uh, it appears that this underwater system requires both calm seas and a fairly flat sea bottom. In Hawaii, most of our underwater munition sites are around rocky offshore islands that were used as bombing targets with rocky sea bottoms and sometimes rough sea conditions. So AGC is less important since most UXO are completely or partially exposed, but digital mapping of sites would be a game changer. Are you aware of anyone that is working on something smaller, perhaps handheld, that would allow for mapping under these conditions? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, just on the... Um... The calm sea. So we, we have a proposal in to put a heave compensated winch onto the system. So that would allow us to, to deal with um, rougher seas. It definitely doesn't address the issue with a rough sea bottom. Um, I mean, we, we do a lot of work in Europe with, it's an ROV mounted system uh, and it's just a single transmitter. It's still six foot by six foot wide, the transmitter. Um, so maybe that's bigger than, than what they're thinking about, but that's definitely one way you can do it. So mount the system on an ROV, single transmitter, uh, then you can navigate around your rocky terrain um, and still maintain fairly cr close proximity to the sea bottom. Great, thank you. This next question is from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Can the technology you described be used for identifying shipwrecks? Um, yeah, I mean, it can detect any metallic item. Um, I would think if you're scanning for shipwrecks though, that you might, you know, multi-beam or acoustic methods might allow you to to do much faster surveys, uh, to look for more visual indications of the shipwreck. But if it's completely buried, 
that's when I think you could use a system, uh, this system to to look for, yeah, completely buried shipwrecks. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is from Montana Technological University. What is your sampling rate for data acquisition from the receivers? Yeah, so I mean, I can answer that question a few ways. So I think I mentioned that the introduction, we fire the transmitter 180 times per second. Um, and then we do a bunch of stacking and we end up with it's 15 time decays every second. So that's that's one way of answering that question. The other one is if, if the question was on the sampling rate of the actual receiver, um, before we do the, the stacking and windowing, uh, that's 800 kilohertz. So that's the, the raw rate that the A to Ds work in, in the um, Ultra 10 receiver. Thank you. A question from Geometrics. Uh, did you model the background dependence on temperature? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think there's fairly standard formulas for predicting the conductivity based on salinity and temperature. So when we do the modeling, we just enter in the conductivity. But if you wanted to play games of like, well, yeah, what would happen in this particular site if the water temperature rose five or 10 degrees, I think it's pretty straightforward to uh, predict what the change in conductivity would be with, with temperature. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is um, from Amusa Environmental um, on slide 52. If we could please go to that slide. You showed that the signal was higher at near surface depth. Does that preclude the system from being deployed in near shore or shallower environment? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it also depends on water depth. So you get a stronger response when you've got deeper water. So when you get into shallower water, the response actually goes down. So that, yeah, there are two effects that compete against each other. One is, yeah, you're closer to that air water interface, but there's a, a weaker signal anyway, because you've got less water. So I think there's nothing that would preclude you going all the way to, you know, effectively zero water depth. If you could get the system in there, that becomes another challenge or another issue. Great, thank you so much. Um, and, and just uh, see more questions before we wrap up. Um, did you or do you plan to assess the potential um, for false negatives? That is the chance that an ordinance is there but not detected. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess it's the same possibility with terrestrial, right? So, you know, when you do terrestrial AGC, there's a lot of QA and QCs that you put out and, and you're obsessively trying to work out, of, are you possibly leaving things behind? Um, it's a bit of an unknown of how you would implement a similar process in the marine environment, given it's uh, much more expensive to put seed items in. So again, I think if you just do something that's objective, repeatable and defensible, um, you know, you do a, a good job on your quality control, that's as good as you can do. And hopefully if you do it all correctly, you're minimizing the chance of any false negatives. Uh, one more question related to the expected performance in freshwater 
compared to seawater or salt water. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So the great thing about fresh water is that um, there's virtually no conductivity, so uh, much smaller background. So I would expect that we would do even better in fresh water. Um, we could also use earlier times, but actually don't think that would make that much difference because even though I say we avoid the early time channels, we're still using quite early in time, somewhere around the 100, 150 to, 100, uh, to 200 microseconds. Um, we don't tend to use much earlier than that anyway in the terrestrial environment. So again, I think fresh water would just make the problem quite a bit simpler. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, we got a lot of questions about uh, where additional information can be found. So I'd like us to go to slide 73. As a reminder, everyone can download Steve's slides from uh, the webinar webpage dedicated to, his, to this webinar. And if you click on the link here, you can download for free the entirety of the project report, which I can see is posted. Are there any additional sources of information, Steve, that you would like to refer folks to? Uh, the, so is the demonstration report for Swim Bay and Ostrich Bay posted? Because that's two sources of information. I just see right now a report titled MR19-5073 Detection and Classification Performance Report and yep. a User's Guide. So do you anticipate posting any additional documents and what's the timeline for these documents? Yeah, I'll check and make sure that the demonstration reports are posted and if they're not, then we'll get them posted. That would be fantastic. And uh, any new updates for all of you on this project will be posted on this uh, project webpage linked here. Excellent. So just to wrap up, Steve, uh, what are the next steps in this work? Um, so we're hoping to deploy the system onto a larger, more capable vessel um, that would also have a I mentioned before a heave compensated winch. So um, that would allow us to go into rougher uh, conditions. So potentially offshore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate everybody tuning in and thank you, Steve, for a fantastic presentation and a very engaging Q&A session. Before we wrap up, I'd like to remind everyone that our next webinar is two weeks from today, Thursday, November 3rd. Uh, it will feature DOD-funded research efforts to advance the remediation of munitions constituents in contaminated surface and or groundwater. Um, the webinar will feature two speakers from the University of Connecticut and Villanova University. Registration is open, so please visit the CERDAP and ESCP webinar webpage to register for this and other webinars through the beginning of next year. And as Dave mentioned, the next MR webinar will be on January 12, 2023. And before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you can just take a few minutes to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. Uh, this concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for joining us.